iSelect Fund is not soliciting investment or providing investment advice in any way whatsoever. This presentation is general industry research based on publicly available information. iSelect is an early stage venture capital firm in St. Louis focused on early stage companies in food, agriculture, and health. iSelect invests at the forefront of innovation, seeking emerging problems, solutions, and technologies. iSelect uses these deep dive presentations not only as a way to better engage with and understand new science and technology, but also engage with the experts and entrepreneurs who drive and change innovation in their respective fields. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to iSelect's Deep Dive webinar series. My name is Tom Bunn, an associate on the iSelect Ventures team, and I'm excited to walk you through today's discussion. For those new to these webinars, iSelect is an early stage venture capital firm in St. Louis, Missouri, focused on early stage companies in food, agriculture, and health. iSelect invests at the forefront of innovation, seeing emerging problems, solutions, and technologies in their infancy. And we use these deep dive presentations not only as a way for us to better engage with and understand new science and technology, but also to engage with the experts and entrepreneurs who are driving change and innovation in their respective fields. One theme that we've been researching is home health. The past two years have pulled what feels like a decade's worth of interest, demand, and innovation for home health forward. Telehealth, which is just one aspect of home health, grew 63x during the pandemic. And today, almost 80% of the U.S. population has used telehealth. The pandemic aside, latent demand for home health has been increasing just by virtue of the astronomical rise in healthcare costs, particularly for hospital stays and ER visits. Combined with an aging population that wants to age with dignity in their own homes and improving sensor technology, we have a perfect storm to reimagine where and how healthcare gets delivered. For these reasons, home health is of increasing interest to iSelect. Uh, I'll give some brief introductions, then I'll give a very brief background. Uh, we have some great introductions. I want to short circuit my comments and get right to the experts. And then, of course, we'll have some time for conversation and Q&A. So with that, let me introduce today's uh, attendees and experts and entrepreneurs. And uh, I'm delighted that they could join us and, and deeply appreciative that they could spare some time uh, to share their expertise with us. Uh, we have Alicia Chong Rodriguez. Uh, Alicia is an engineer and inventor who is the founder and CEO of Bloomer Tech. She designs wearable technologies that can allow for personalized healthcare, particularly in the treatment of cardiovascular disease in women. She was named a TED Fellow in 2021. Secondly, we have Satya Alumalai. Satya is the founder and CEO of IDAR Health and healthcare executive with 15 plus years of experience in improving the quality and safety of healthcare. He has been featured in 200 plus media publications and holds a dual master's degree in public health and an MBA in healthcare management from Johns Hopkins University. Thirdly, Sandra Van Tries. Sandra was the group president at BJC Healthcare until her retirement in 2020. She was also the president of BJC's Accountable Care Organization from its establishment in 2012. Prior to her work with BJC, Sandra served as president and CEO of the insurer Unicare, which was a WellPoint Health Networks subsidiary. She also served as the COO and CFO of Right Choice Managed Care, uh, the parent company of Blue Cross Blue Shield of Missouri. She's actively involved as a board member for a number of healthcare organizations as well. Finally, we have Dr. Adam Wolfberg. Adam is an obstetrician, uh, a runner, and a writer. Based in Boston, Adam, Adam is the chief medical officer at Current Health, where he leads the clinical team and conducts research improving healthcare for patients with chronic disease. Adam's first book, Fragile Beginnings, was published in 2013 and dives into the complex world of newborn intensive care. He has written for The Atlantic, Slate, The Wall Street Journal, The Boston Globe Magazine, and other publications. So let's get into it. As I mentioned in the introduction, uh, there's currently a perfect storm for, for home health technologies, a number of macro trends uh, to really um, allow home health technologies to make their mark. Um, take these headlines as kind of a jumping off point and, and a framing of some of the problems uh, that our entrepreneurs and experts are, are helping to solve today. So um, starting from the top here, according to the CDC, 90% of the nation's $3.8 trillion in annual healthcare expenditures are for people with chronic and mental health conditions. So this is an astronomical number. Uh, that 3.8 trillion represents about 17% of GDP and growing. Um, some analysts say that's closer to 19% um, in 2021, 2022. 
Um, so it's a huge number uh, that that is focused on chronic disease, um, which is really different than kind of the episodic care in hospitals that, 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 that hospitals specialize in. Uh, additionally, as we all know, the pandemic accelerated remote care like nothing else ever has. Uh, people are now comfortable with it. Uh, about 80% of the US population has now experienced a telehealth visit. And <clears throat> increasingly, payers are getting more comfortable with it as well. Um, hospital home, the hospital home waiver uh, reimbursed uh, hospital at home programs at parity to traditional care within the, the four walls of a hospital. Um, and hopefully that's something we see, we see continue. Um, <clears throat> also, according to data published by the Association of American Medical Colleges, uh, the U.S. could see a shortage of between 37,000 and 124,000 physicians by 2034. Uh, that's primary and specialty care physicians uh, that are uh, on the precipice of a, a, a steep shortage. Um, additionally, as we all know, the aging population is going to put increasing pressure on our healthcare uh, resources. People are living longer. Uh, many chronic uh, diseases are also age-related diseases. Um, one stark projection related to, to chronic and age-related diseases is the number of people living with Alzheimer's in the U.S. is expected to increase from 6 million today to almost 13 million by 2050. And finally, sensors are, are not only ubiquitous, but increasingly powerful and sensitive. Um, they're only going to get more sensitive, more powerful, and, um, and stealth, um, which is a great segue to our first entrepreneur um, who is developing a stealth sensor in Bloomer Tech. Um, Alicia, can you tell us a little bit about um, what you're doing at Bloomer Tech and, and why it's so important? Yes, hi, Tom. Thank you for having me. I'm really happy to join this panel. Um, so hello, everyone. My name is Alicia. I'm founder and CEO at Bloomer Tech, as Tom mentioned. Uh, my background is in electrical engineering and computer science. And uh, back at MIT, I met my co-founders. And we had many personal stories that we shared with each other, uh, some of them including uh, I am very proudly named Alicia after my grandma, who dedicated her life to women's health as an obstetrician back in a time when women were rarely allowed to, to obtain medical degrees, right? And, and we lost her to a heart attack when I was only 13 years old. And then when, when one of my co-founders was 12, she was waiting at school for her mom to pick her up. Uh, from school, and that didn't happen because her mom, who was a 44-year-old physician, suddenly died from a stroke. And the, these stories are unfortunately very common, and for us, it is very shocking that 30 years, uh, that 15 years later, sorry, there's over 30 years of evidence that shows that there's sex differences in cardiovascular diseases and strokes, and yet it's like none of the tools that we have today or the technologies are tailored for the specific differences that have been already identified between men and women. So we thought, okay, now everyone's building all of these solutions around AI and machine learning. And I had been part of the MIT Computational Cardiovascular Research Group. That's where I, I did my thesis. And I had access to some of the world's biggest data sets in the world. You know, so when you see uh, data sets like Framingham or Grace and you realize that, hey, only one in every four clinical trial participants are female, it's, it's pretty shocking because you're building algorithms based on those data sets. And, and, and for us, and with, with all of the evidence of algorithmic biases and all of these uh, technical challenges that you face because of the quality and the type of the data that you're collecting, um, we, we thought we could do something about it. And that's what we decided to, to go after. We've been working very hard to, to build uh, a, one of the most comfortable devices that can collect data in a fast way for women. And we've created a, and patented textile a, sensors that are medical grade. So they look and feel just like any other type of clothing and they can integrate seamlessly into a everyday bras. So we, we a, a, to, to what Tom was saying, it's a stealth device because you don't even realize that it's there 
It doesn't have a screen or, or anything. It just looks and feels like any other ordinary bra, but now it collects extraordinary data, right? Data that can be used uh, for better early detection, that can be used to, to titrate medication because women metabolize drugs, drugs differently. Uh, it can be used for, for a lot of different um, a, a conditions and, and diseases that, that we, we are seeing uh, people facing today. So uh, that's, that's uh, basically what, what we're doing and why we're doing it. And we can discuss further as the panel goes through. Great, thank you, Alicia. Um, just a, a couple questions right off the bat. Can you talk about the sensitivity of the sensors and um, what, what you think is as kind of the near-term clinical utility uh, what what sort of um, disease indications or other ailments are, are you initially going after? Yeah, so there's there's a couple of things there. We've done early feasibility studies at the MIT Clinical Research Center when we compared our sensors to a traditional halter, a, a, not a halter, sorry, a traditional ECG, hospital ECG device. And in terms of sensitivity, we, we had a 92% um, a similar signal. We, we had a protocol where there's motion and there's different things in terms of, of giving stress to the sensors and ours actually performed better. It was 92% similar, but the rest, the 8% that was different, uh, ours was performing better. And we are doing other studies because we've designed it in a way where we take into account the differences that, that men and women have in, in the physiology for the interpretation of the data, but also in the, um, in the design of the device and how we kind of reduce all of these um, issues that other manufacturers are not taking into consideration that cause uh, our sources of noise or lower yield in these devices because women have breast tissue or they have a different lifestyle and, and needs that haven't been considered in the, in the design of other devices that can be attached like stickers, for example, a, or that can have wires that babies can pull. Different, different things like that have been considered in the design of our, our device. Great, and I, I understand you're also um, targeting a, a consumer pathway as well. Can you talk about uh, kind of the, the the plan you have for the split strategy between, um, you know, helping healthcare organizations and going direct to consumer? Uh, curious how you're thinking about that uh, dual pronged approach. Yeah, so so for us, it is very key that we focus on the medical grade quality of our device. We want to be able to to get better and better because we, we right now we can collect the traditional uh, biomarkers like you have listed here: electrocardiogram, respiratory rate, heart rhythm, right? But but we're a continuous monitor. We can collect a lot of data over time. Right. If you think about it, in one in one day we collect a, over 500 megabytes of data per patient. That's that's a lot of data, and a, this means that we're not like a picture that just that snapshot in time. We work more like a video, right? So we we foresee that we're going to be able to help make decisions, predict predictions. A, in a better way over time. So we do have identified some of the digital biomarkers that we're going to be able to give consumers once we're ready for that consumer a, a population. We are first focusing on monitoring a, a patients that already have been diagnosed a, and or have a high risk of heart disease and stroke. Fantastic. Well, we have, um, we'll have, I'm sure, some more questions towards the end, but Alicia, thanks for walking us through what you're up to at, at Bloomer Tech. Uh, in the interest of time, um, want to move on to uh, Satya at, at IDAR. Um, IDAR, oh, forgot to show this uh, infographic on Lily, the, uh, the product that 
Alicia and Bloomer Tech uh, are developing here. Um, but Satya, can you give us an, an update, uh, an overview on, on IDAR and, and what you're working on? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Tom, for this opportunity. Um, I'm Satya. I'm the founder and CEO of ADAR Health. ADAR is a digital medicine company where we aim to reimagine today's standards for chronic disease management, digital medicine, and aging in place. Um, our mission is to actually design and deliver evidence-based digital medicine tools and interventions to improve the quality of life of patients with chronic condition and also empower them to make sustainable behavior changes. Uh, it all really started with my mom. She was diagnosed with uh, diabetes almost 15 years ago and then hypertension, but we all, everybody thinks, right? I mean, diabetes and hypertensions are uh, really common conditions today. People just take it for granted, um, which also what happened in my mom's mother's case where uh, that led to actually now she has chronic kidney disease and, and it's being it's brutal to be a caregiver because you have to measure every drop of water and every gram of salt because of her fluid restriction and salt restricted diet, um, which is where there was always this frustration, right, uh, to find a solution that is not measuring only one aspect or just the primary condition, but also something that can measure an individual's overall health. Um, and we, me and my co-founders, um, they were looking into where we can collect hundreds and thousands of health information from an individual and at least help use that data to map somebody's health every single day, um, which is what led us to build uh, this device. This is, uh, this is our device, a small handle device. It's more like a breathalyzer. The user holds a device and places it in the mouth and breathes through it normally for 30 seconds. At the end of 30 seconds, they perform lung function tests, essentially taking a deep inhale and forcefully exhale twice. Essentially today, our device measures the user's temperature, blood pressure, ECG, oxygen saturation, pulse rate, respiratory rate, respiratory flow morphology, heart rate, heart rate variability, and lung functions. Um, it, provides a more holistic view of an individual's health every single day. Um, and this device is um, also sends the data using 4G. So it has um, um, a chip within IoT technology. So somebody doesn't have a smart device, they could still use the device. And it also, the device also has communication capability. So you can actually interact with it if required. Um, the best part about it is like after almost uh, six years of working on it, uh, we finally FDA cleared, CE mark approved, ISO certified, MDSAP certified, um, and HIPAA compliant and GDPR compliant. Uh, why I mentioned all those things is primarily when we started, we didn't want it to really look into another consumer gadget uh, or another technology, but we wanted something that is very simple to use. At the same time, it is medical grade. So um, we're fortunate that we got all those 10 plus parameters FDA cleared today. And we are using this technology and our enterprise platform to help manage patients with chronic conditions uh, and also work with um, pharmaceutical partners or pharmaceutical companies to help use that data to actually help improve um, their drug uh, efficacy, look at the effectiveness of a medication, look at toxicity, tolerability, and various other things, uh, which is very integral to manage somebody's health. And then also the key factor is it's, it's not like in any, any other device, it's not like one-off uh, where we start like getting to a point, but in this case, because of the device actually goes in the mouth, it has access to breath and saliva, which in turn gives access to many other biological indicators of health. So right now we are working on, already start working on the next versions of the device, which includes other biomarkers, breath and saliva based, um, which will also go through validations and hopefully we'll have at least a version every year uh, in the next few years. So my, my co-founder calls it, it's more like a check engine light for humans, which is uh, what we are trying to achieve uh, so that at least spend one minute of your day to get a comprehensive health assessment. So. I'll probably stop here. I know there's some questions, but uh, happy to tell you a little bit more about the tech and, and also the business. Great. Well, first question that comes to mind, uh, Sathya, is, is um, what the disease indications you guys are, are focusing on with these, uh, with the health systems 
and uh, also with the uh, the pharmaceutical side. Can you talk about the ideal situations for which this technology is 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 suited? Absolutely. I think uh, because of this barometer and there are a lot of people just always uh, more interested on the respiratory side. So we also uh, focusing on asthma and COPD, uh, but also um, working on certain initiatives uh, with heart failure uh, and CKD or chronic kidney disease. Um, so those are the four indi conditions and indications that we're working on. Uh, from a pharmaceutical company perspective, there are a lot of applications from the oncology side, which we are exploring right now. Um, so we, we, because the, the value of measuring all these parameters is really critical in, in almost all the conditions, so we can expand into others, but right now its primary focus is respiratory. Got it. Do you see a market for, um, for direct-to-consumer um, you know, in-home wellness, or is that uh, um, not something you guys are focused on at this point? No, I think we definitely wanted to expand our capabilities. I think direct to consumers would be a great uh, opportunity for us, but I think we also need to build our capabilities to support um, scaling into direct to consumers. So we are really looking into that next year. Uh, this year, we are more focused on our current efforts. Sure. And can you describe it at a high level, um, some of the, the pharmaceutical partnerships, if you can? Yeah, I think we, we signed a major uh, pharma partnership where we're really looking into building our technology as, as a digital companion tool for asthma patients. Um, I think we are the first device that can not only just look at asthma, but also other um, overlapping conditions, like for example, COPD. So uh, we're working with our pharma partner to really leverage our technology to help predict an exacerbation at a very early stage and then prevent uh, hospitalization, but also help guide them through their um, care journey and, and offer um, superior value to some of the products, uh, pharma products that are out there. So um, we, we are putting in both our technology and platform to help enable that kind of an interaction between the patients and the, um, the users or the participants or patients. Got it. And one of the obvious positive attributes of this is it's, it's a one-stop shop for all of these biomarkers, right? Um, can you talk about the kind of the, the biomarkers that you think are the most unique um, that give you kind of a unfair advantage in, in this market and, 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 and why that particular biomarker is unique and kind of the development uh, that you had to do to, to, um, to put those all under one roof? Yeah, I think uh, for us, we definitely went, did not go into the path of like, okay, let's put in like 10, 10 things. But uh, these were done through like user studies where we looked into today, like polychronic condition is a new normal. Uh, most people have at least two or three chronic conditions. So we looked into what are the factors that are essential for them and what are something that needs to be measured at the same time. And compared to measuring one or two parameters uh, continuously, what we saw is like measuring everything at the same time offered superior value and insights and a broader picture. So one, looking into our, our end of the system where you can see everything at the same time, we can look into false positives and, and also pick up false negatives. So some of the parameters that you look into, like for example, blood pressure is, is a key indicator. Um, not a lot of people have that. Uh, and also from respiratory flow morphology, which is more like a unique fingerprint uh, for an individual. So we can do a lot of analysis with just the respiratory flow morphology uh, that we measure. Uh, in addition to that, we, we have a couple of other breath-based uh, capabilities that are um, currently uh, in our uh, in our device, which we once we get our FDA clearance, we will actually um, really report those uh, as well. Those are the key things that are going to make it indispensable. Awesome. Well, really cool technology, uh, Sathya. Thanks for joining us uh, again. We'll have uh, some more questions uh, at the end as time allows. But uh, thank you very much. Absolutely. Thanks, Tom. Um, next up. Dr. Adam Wolfberg from, from Current Health. Um, Adam, can you talk to us about, about Current? I know you're, you're um, a bit uh, senior to some of these other uh, startups. You've been, Current has, has been around uh, for a bit and has uh, 
is now a Best Buy company. Um, curious kind of what Current Health is up to um, and how you think about uh, your, your core uh, value proposition at, at Current. Um, thanks. And, and I'm not sure we're senior. I think we just got acquired. Perhaps that was, yeah, um, the wrong, wrong use of words there. <laughs> Uh, so Current Health uh, enables uh, healthcare providers to take care of patients in the home. Um, and uh, Tom, if you go to that slide, um, this sort of covers what we do. The, the, uh, at our core, we're a data platform and we enable the collection of vital signs, patient information, uh, and uh, other data from the patient in the home, uh, make it available to healthcare providers remotely to manage that care and then integrate it into the electronic health record and, and other um, systems. We, have, we do have our own proprietary wearable that streams continuous vital signs, heart rate, respiratory rate, oxygen saturation, um, step count, and, and skin temperature but we are increasingly becoming device agnostic, uh, recognizing that patients and their providers want to select the vital sign monitoring devices that are most appropriate. And so we accept data from those devices uh, as well. That is from FDA cleared, highly reliable medical devices as well. Uh, we provide connectivity in the home because we want to be um, available to patients in all locations, uh, irrespective of their, um, whether or not they have a smartphone, whether they have internet in the home, whether they uh, have English as a first language, uh, we're very focused on enabling um, the, the, the crossing of uh, health equity barriers. Um, and we wrap this with, with services. We'll deliver the technology, we'll pick up and clean the technology. We have a nursing team that will monitor vital sign data. And so, as you can imagine, we end up powering um, a number of clinical programs, including the hospital at home programs that are part of the CMS hospital at home waiver, uh, admission, readmission, prevention, chronic disease programs, population health programs. We also work with, with uh, large pharmaceutical organizations to enable their uh, decentralized clinical trials. And, and we were privileged to be part of a couple of the COVID vaccine trials, um, supervising the safety of, of patient um, uh, participants during that process. Um, in terms of the organization, uh, we were founded by um, a couple of guys in uh, Scotland um, in 2015. And the, the company pivoted a, a few times before landing on the home-based uh, monitoring environment. Um, the R&D team is in Edinburgh, the center of our commercial operation is in Boston. And uh, it turned out that we were a good fit for the, the vision of the Best Buy Health organization to be part of their ecosystem. And so uh, the company was acquired, Current Health was acquired in November. And so we're in really sort of the early days of um, beginning to be integrated into that, that broader Best Buy Health uh, ecosystem. Um, Best Buy Health has a, a suite of products and services that, that uh, enable care in the home. They have an active aging business, for example, that, that provides services and um, fall detection and connectivity to seniors in the home. Uh, we also have caring centers that, that um, reach out to patients on behalf of payers and providers and, and um, writ large reach about a, a million patients in any given, um, in any given month. Uh, so we're excited to be part of that broader organization and see a lot of opportunity in, in allowing patients to receive health services where they want, when they want them. Um, but it was, a, a, you know, to your your point, uh, Tom, it was a little bit early in current health's journey. Um, we were not expecting to be acquired uh, literally six months after we raised a large B round. Um, but it's uh, been a perfect fit and we're really excited about that process. 
Great. Thank you, Adam. You mentioned uh, a million patients per month. Is that just on is that just on the Best Buy side or can you give a sense of kind of the, the scale, the patient, how much how many patients you're touching in general, uh, you know, um, uh, through all of your partnerships? Yeah, so that that's largely Best Buy. So so okay. if you if you go online, if you go into a store, uh, you can buy the lively suite of products. Um, and uh, that the variety of different devices that have fall detection and a, and a single button that connects the consumer to a um, caring center where someone who's exquisitely trained will help solve their problem, whether they did in fact fall and they need emergency services, it's a per service, or whether they needed to be connected, for example, to a, uh, a licensed social worker who can help solve problems of food insecurity, loneliness, um, transportation, uh, even access to care. We have a new partnership with a telehealth physician company to, to provide access to care um, through these programs. And um, then that suite of services becomes more and more complex, reaching current health at the top of the complexity spectrum. And we serve about 20,000 patients on any given day across about 60 health systems, uh, in the U.S., uh, across the NHS in the U.K., and through a handful of, of um, global pharmaceutical partners. Terrific. I've heard you, I listened to a podcast a couple of days ago, and I heard you say that 75% um, uh, of Americans live within 15 miles of a Best Buy, and you were uh, explaining the customer service, the, the great customer service uh, component that Best Buy has. You know, curious if you can, if you can, um, how you think the integration is going? You know, obviously, that's part of the customer service is on the Geek Squad side. You, do you see the Geek Squad, uh, you know, coupling or, or uh, you know, beginning to have sort of nurse practitioner capabilities? Or how do you see kind of the great customer service that's that's been um, established already in Best Buy's historic business with with this new Best Buy Health side? Yeah, it's a great question, and you know, I I, I would say that where there's real synergy between current health philosophy and Best Buy's philosophy is in that, that sort of customer uh, interaction. I, I have the personal experience at current health of having both outsourced our level one technical support and outsourced our um, clinical nurse triage service, um, failed to provide a level of service that we thought our patients, our clients' patients deserve. And so brought them in house and built two in house W two teams to provide that service. Um, so like I I know what good looks like and I know what bad feels like and and um, and Best Buy is the same way and and so you know I, I think you you of course you run into the 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 dichotomy between really high quality well trained customer support patient support and the demand to provide a cost-effective solution, you know, perhaps uh, offshoring it. Um, and I think that where we and, and, and Best Buy see things is that, that the, uh, and unless it's incredibly high quality, it, it just doesn't serve the business. And when we bring together our approach and the Geek Squad and these caring centers, and I, and I visited them myself and sort of listened to these calls, it's a, it's a great, it's a great approach. It, it may not be the most cost-effective approach, but it, it's it's a great approach. Great. And the website mentions some some pretty astounding outcomes data on you know readmissions, uh, ER visits. Uh, I was hoping you could expand on some of those and and um, what what you're seeing in terms of kind of the, the clinical utility and and uh, from a different view, kind of the cost savings to to your customers. Sure. I, I, I mean, I I'm. I'm not exactly the sort of target physician demographic of, of current health because I um, practice obstetrics, but I, I have plenty of experience of having the patient who, you know, for example, the patient with preeclampsia after delivery, who's sort of on the cusp. Is it safe to send them home? Is it not safe to send them home? Can we have, a, can we have insight into their blood pressure as we continue to titrate their medication? Or, or And the, the instinct of any any well-intentioned physician is to keep the patient around so you can keep an eye on them and make sure that, that they will genuinely be safe when they go home. And to give them 
a connected set of devices that allows for supervision through telehealth interaction enables early discharge. I mean, we see it again and again where patients are, are really ready to go, but they need a little more surveillance. And so we enable that prompt discharge. And naturally that's cost effective. You have to have the right payment mechanism. I and mean, for hospitals that are paid you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, it, it doesn't work necessarily. They don't want to send discharge that patient. For hospitals that have tons of capacity, they may not be in a super rush to get patients out. But you know, these days, uh, value-based care is is more and more reality, and and particularly in urban areas where capacity has been a, a major problem, we're seeing that really resonate from a cost reduction perspective. Great. Last question is just around kind of how you discount the probability of the permanent regulatory or the reimbursement change. Um, as you're as you're close to all this, um, curious how you're thinking about when, if, what that discount looks like for uh, that, that parity of reimbursement uh, for hospital at home type of care? Yeah, so for, for those who aren't familiar with it, there's a CMS waiver in place right now that essentially allows a very quick path for hospitals to stand up uh, these hospital at home programs where if they provide genuine hospital level care to patients who meet inpatient criteria in the home, they can re be reimbursed to parity, which has allowed a lot of hospitals supposed to stand up these very acute programs um, pretty quickly. And the question is, how long does this waiver stick around and what, what follows it? And I, I, I have a, you know, a couple thoughts on it. I mean, first of all, I think that we've seen um, really great outcomes and potentially better outcomes as patients are cared for outside of a, of a facility where nosocomial infection is a big deal. Um, and patient satisfaction is super high. We certainly see that in our NPS scores. Um, it seems to me implausible that the hospital home program is going to simply go away. We've made too much progress. We've shown too much impact. I can't imagine it's going to go away. Is it going to get paid at parity? I can't imagine it would be, honestly. Uh, if it's the same, uh, it, it, the incentives end up being wrong. But is it paid at 80 cents? Is it paid at 90 cents on the dollar? Uh, that's what I sort of imagine. Um, I think the other issue that we're going to need to sort of uh, address is what about the problem of creating reimbursable bed days that don't have any state-based regulation? So, you know, the, the, the certificate of need programs don't necessarily apply to hospital at home beds. And so um, we know that building beds and building facilities can simply balloon costs just by building them. Um, you know, here in Boston, for example, um, Mass General Brigham is in this sort of uh, regulatory and, and public relations campaign uh, fight against uh, um, a variety of, of public interest folks who are just worried about the cost of care if, if MGB builds a big new facility on the South Shore. So, you know, these are really common state level uh, challenges and CMS is going to have to think about that when they start authorizing um, virtual uh, services um, that are expensive. Fantastic. Well, Adam, thank you for joining us uh, again. I'm sure we'll have some questions towards the end, um, but wanna uh, switch, switch gears a little bit. Um, we have Sandra Van Tries, um, who was former president of uh, BJC Healthcare as well as the BJC ACO, um, obviously lived through a, a inflection point um, with the beginning of the, the COVID pandemic. Sandra, curious how you uh, get to get a little bit of your background and, and how you think of uh, some of these emerging home health technologies wearing both your um, your uh, uh, health system hat as well as your, your payer hat. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Good, good uh, morning, good day to everyone. Um, pleased to be here and thank you for the panelists. Um, I've learned a lot about each of your innovations and they're very exciting. Um, my background, um, as Tom has mentioned, most recently, past 16 years or so, was with BJC Healthcare in St. Louis. We're a integrated, um, 15 hospital integrated uh, organization. We are affiliated with the Washington University Medical School here in St. Louis. And I had the opportunity to do a number of innovative things, uh, frankly, which was um, very crystallized as it relates to the topics that we're talking about here today. 
Um, prior to my stint on the provider side, I spent 10 plus years on the payer side, um, serving as a president and or CEO or some suite, C-suite um, role in um, Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, and in one of the WellPoint companies, as Tom mentioned. So I, you know, I bring to this a payer and a provider perspective and was particularly um, focused on the integration of those two um, sectors of healthcare, frankly, because one being the financing and one being the proviso of care. So uh, it's it's exciting that we can that we continue to look for ways to solve not only clinical uh, risk challenges but also those financial risk challenges. And happy to be here, Tom. Thank you. Great, um, thank you, Sandra. Really appreciate it. Um, so curious to get your perspective on the biggest opportunity that you see from a from a provider perspective here um, for uh, not only this this area in general but you know specifically perhaps uh, focusing on the, the entrepreneurs we just heard from um, kind of what you think uh, the biggest opportunities are as from your experience on the provider side and and how you would go about digging at some of these opportunities um, you know as a case in point with some of the, the technologies and companies we've had we've heard today. Yeah, yeah, you know, and, and um, you know, the pandemic uh, really crystallized uh, uh, and focused providers, I would tell, uh, I would say like nothing that we'd ever seen in our lifetimes before. And safety, of course, was paramount, you know, safety of the teams, safety of the patients. There were a lot of organizations that made decisions to stop providing not what they were, was deemed non-emergent care. Um, it was a critical component of, of the last couple of years. It was a difficult one. One thing it taught most providers, and I'm sure that Dr. Wolfer could also um, support this, is when we start to focus on something and you have a laser-like focus, which the pandemic required, you know, things get solved. And my example in terms of its applicability here is the virtual care, the, the telehealth, telemedicine. We've been working on that for several years to launch that in a meaningful, scalable way. We got it done in three weeks because we had to. It was the only way we were going to see certain patients. Um, and uh, Tom indicated earlier, you said that, that people are getting comfortable with it in terms of the statistics. Well, we not only did the patients become comfortable with it, but importantly, the providers had to learn how to do this. This was not something that they normally did. And, um, and so they had to get comfortable with it. Uh, so we're not only teaching patients, but we're also teaching those who prescribe and provide the care. It did, of course, elevate the concerns relative to the patients we were not able to see. All of these people that you're talking about with chronic conditions, how do you stay connected? And frankly, what would CMS and the other payers allow us to do? That emergency use order and emergency orders that, that Dr. Wolfram talked about was critical. And how it, get, how it plays out in the future is also critical. I completely agree. It's unlikely that we're going to continue these reimbursements at the parity level. Um, but I also agree it's, hard, it's going to be hard going back because to the point about, you know, what's the opportunity for, from a provider standpoint, Tom, um, you know, all providers are focusing on demonstrating en enhanced outcomes, you know, reduction of readmissions, avoiding unnecessary emergency room visits. And they're struggling on the staffing side with having clinicians, you know, home health clinicians that go visit people in the market. Um, there's not enough people and the workload is too, too much. So how do you deploy technologies that can integrate with a, a health system's clinical records, I think, and be trusted you know, by the providers, that interest will continue to grow. We just have, have to figure out how to make that happen. Interesting. One, one question your comments uh, sparked is, is just about patient sentiment and, you know, whether or not reimbursement gets billed at parity going forward, that seems to be, uh, you know, an open question. But, you know, the patient sentiment side, do you have, from any of your experience, um, have you found that patients receiving telehealth or home health kind of implicitly think that their care is, is less than uh, or, or, you know, 
not, not as not as beneficial uh, as receiving care within the four walls of a hospital? Or how do you think the patient sentiment? Obviously, many patients are touching telehealth uh, for the first mm-hmm. time over the last two years. But how is how do you think patient sentiment stacks up? And um, do they do they think they're getting parity of care? Right. Yeah, I, I think it's a it's a valid question that all of the entrepreneurs, the innovators need to think about. And I would probably say it depends not to evade it. But I think that the patient, the consumer journey, the customer journey is one that everyone needs to think about because the journey for a 35 year old um, female with two kids, perhaps um, it may be a different journey than the 78 year old um, gentleman who's retired and, and is used to a certain type of relationship with their provider. So um, I do think it does depend. And I think it, it is uh, um, innovators are well served to think about the patient journeys and create scenarios. Because, you know, if, if I were talking to um, uh, Satya and Alicia specifically, and, and I, I want to know who really gets specific about who your target market is, right? How does the patient interact with something in this techno- technological space? Are they savvy? Um, what do they have at home? So how do you position this really to solve that problem from the consumer patient's perspective? Um, and then on the flip side, frankly, you know, you got to think about it from the provider side too, Tom. Um, it's a workflow issue for most providers, not only a finance question, but it's a workflow. There's a lot of data, as both Alicia and Satya said, there's a ton of data and that's being transmitted by the patient to the provider. What do they do with it? It can be overwhelming. And um, the patient has an expectation, is my experience, that because this, these data are available, the provider knows it as quickly as they do. And they perhaps have an expectation that is um, one of a very quick response. Some providers are comfortable with that, some providers are not. Got it, great, thank you. Um, Wanna switch gears a little bit. Um, Sandra, if if you were being pitched these companies uh, tomorrow wearing your, your BJC president hat, uh, what would be, what's the most important thing? What's the most important question? Uh, perhaps you just alluded to it, but, um, you know, would love to hear what you, what you think the most important thing is, and, and then perhaps to get, uh, you know, some, some responses from our entrepreneurs on the call today. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I do think it's a bit about how, you know, what is, what is the target? And, and I have the, uh, probably multi-factored questions. Who buys this? How does it get to the end user? What triggers the end user to get it? And, um, you know, in front of all that, of course, is what is the problem from a provider's perspective? I'm the provider. What problem are you trying to solve? Can you really articulate the problem that you're solving? My problem. And then how does it get to where it needs to go? As I alluded to, it's a, it's a workflow question. So we might, you know, we might just stop there and, and, and see, you know, what their thinking is in terms of really um, crystallizing the problem statement from a provider's perspective and then how it gets deployed in, into the workflow. I mean, I can be the first guinea pig here. Um, and and uh, so I think it's a really interesting question and what I would say is sort of how I started is that current health, for example, enables providers to take care of patients in their home. Uh, I would uh, admit to you that that some of the challenges that we encountered uh, were not what I thought. So I'll give you an example. I remember pitching a large health system on a hospital at home program, and I went and talked about our technology and essentially said, however you want to deploy your hospital at home program, we will support you. We will, we will do whatever it is. You just tell us how you want to do it. And we lost that deal um, because the, another one of our competitors went in and said, you know, listen, we have a very strong point of view on how you should deploy your hospital at home program. We will guide you every step of the way. And that's what the health system wanted to hear. And so, you know, since then, we have developed 
deep clinical expertise in um, how you deploy these novel virtual programs. We've built, as I said, services around that in terms of nursing, in terms of logistics, uh, in terms of ancillary services that are not core to our platform like phlebotomy and infusion services because our partners were sort of going down this road with us together. We, we initially thought they were the experts and we would enable it, but we learned that together we had to be the experts. And, and so um, that's how we had to solve some rather novel problems at a very difficult time in sort of our public health history. Mm -hmm. uh, definitely, I wanted to piggyback on what Adam said. I think uh, most of the customers or, or like providers are interested in a single solution that can kind of be end-to-end -end in a way so that they, um, they wanted to know who's accountable for this patient's health. Uh, oftentimes, a lot of technology companies today go and say, okay, we can provide this amazing solution, but then what happens if there's something that comes out of it? Um, which is like, for example, companies like Current Health and others have done a really good job of kind of uh, tying uh, everything together. Um, the other thing is really from a privacy perspective, I think the, I mean, patients are really concerned about their privacy. Um, so what we are doing to help improve privacy and, and definitely improving the clinical decision-making process, right? So you're getting all these data, uh, that's great. And then I can see the patients, but how will I visualize? I mean, what is right? And at what time point you need to get the data? So that's where it's, it's very important to put levers in place so that uh, physicians are informed, but when there is an absolute need uh, and there is another layer of support that is always required, both from a patient as well as provider perspective. Um, I think like there are a lot of codes right now available to remotely manage patients. So a lot of companies are leveraging that. So that's kind of like um, uh, understood. Uh, most, uh, most companies have taken that approach of getting some uh, revenue or like shared revenue from providers. But what one thing that um, companies or organizations need to really focus on is to actually see what is the long-term value. And, and today there is a huge shortage of healthcare providers or, or staff. So is this solution going to solve my problem of healthcare shortage? It's also something that is very important to address as we are talking to uh, health systems. Fantastic. I, I, I can chip in, in in like a different way because I think one of the, of the things that, that everyone alluded to, right, um, ties in with the fact that for us, we, we, we do focus significantly on women having a cardiac event, right? And after a cardiac event, the average cost typically can be, or the biggest problems that, that providers want to, to not have <laughs> is the fact that she can have a recurring episode, right? And after a cardiac event, there's, there's an average of $1 million uh, of costs on female patients because their outcomes are poorer, right? So we, we know that, and we know that 75% of this can actually be prevented. There's studies that show that it could have been prevented. So using home health and remote monitoring tools, right? Like I, I think there, there are ways where the fact that when we're in the hospital, we have a team of clinicians, when we're out of the hospital, we're on our own. Right, and that home health is enabling this transition, and everything that Adam has shared uh, here is is very exciting, right? Because it's it's kind of that transition that you are not alone at home either. Uh, you you are able to to get back to life without disconnecting, but at the same time feeling that uh, sense of of trust uh, uh, with your healthcare and kind of getting that back into the healthcare system is really important because I, I think um, our, our devices do have to do a lot of work to give trust to the providers by providing that medical grade quality where they can use it for decision-making. Uh, at the same time, we need to be comfortable and easy to use with the patients, right? Which is why 
our device looks unlike any other medical device you've typically seen, right? Like it looks like something you would find in your closet, not in your hospital. So uh, we we do we we have made an effort so that our users can be feel very comfortable by wearing it each day because it's something they they have been used to most of their life, right? So it it doesn't change their daily habits. It it kind of ties into what they're already used to. And I think home health is making that transition so that you can make those lifestyle changes alongside with, with your care providers and these incentivizes uh, the, the providers and the payers because they can actually reduce the biggest problem, which is a recurring episode. Great, thank you, Alicia. And um, looks like we have a question from uh, the audience um, they ask, how is this going to impact the business model of academic medical centers in terms of clinical care and research trials? How do you see this landscape changing? What are the threats to these new models of care? I don't know if anyone wants to take that one. I would definitely like to start, but I think people are going to say amazing things in this one. I just would say that decentralized clinical trials are really happening. They're bringing real world evidence and it's, it's just very exciting to see how different medical device companies, the big ones and um, pharma companies have been interested in our product because we can help them retain and recruit patients to these decentralized clinical trials. Patients that they were before a, a to, to Sandra's point, like a 36 year old mom of two kids will have a harder time participating in a clinical study unless it's decentralized, right? So, so we're, we're opening the doors in a way that is unprecedented, which is exciting. Yeah, I, I, and, and I'll just add, I mean, I think um, there, are, there are so many benefits to clinical trials and, and all that 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 does tell us, but I think we're where a number of these kinds of organizations like like we're hearing from today can help is to take it to the next level. There there are downsides for clinical trials, and uh, Alicia alluded to to them. We all know them. Generally, we um, have uh, we we exclude certain populations from these trials for variability reasons. And um, as such, the outcomes of those clinical trials while leading us into evidence-based care, which is critical, um, may not be as applicable to a patient like me. And so I, I, I look towards the future where the, um, the inclusion in clinical trials of more real world patients will um, continue to, to be supported and um, evolve to get, to get better outcome data. Great, thanks, Sandra. We have a question about cost of these devices. Um, Alicia and Satya, uh, can you kind of comment on, on the cost curve and, and um, what this will be at scale and, and, and as opposed to the current price uh, today? Yeah, I can jump in. I think for us, we, we are pricing it more as, as a SaaS model right now. So we are integrating the device cost into it. Um, but uh, happy to talk offline about, I mean, whoever wants to reach out, uh, definitely wanted to uh, discuss more about the pricing. Um, Great. Well, I know we're at the, the top of the hour here. Um, I'm conscious of our uh, very generous guest time. Um, I want to thank our guests uh, for joining us. Um, as a reminder to those in attendance, we host these calls roughly once a month, alternating between topics in food and ag and healthcare. Uh, my colleague, David Yoakum will be hosting one. Uh, we'll be announcing that uh, shortly in the next coming weeks on some topic, a fascinating topic in food and ag, I'm sure. Um, and we will email you the details of that. So again, thank you to our uh, guests today and thank you to those in attendance and we will see you next time. Everyone have a great day. Thank you, Tom. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thanks, everyone.